Assalamualaikum, salam sejahtera and selamat datang. Ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to the Ministry Industry Dialogue 2014, held in conjunction with the 5th International Green Tech and Eco Products Exhibition and Conference Malaysia, or IGEM. Today we will listen to our distinguished guests sharing valuable information on generating green wealth in spurring a nation's prosperity. Now, before that, allow me to introduce our distinguished panel of speakers, and not just to you, but also to our viewers at home. Uh, seated in the very center, uh, in the middle, is a young berhormat, Datuk Sri Panglima Dr. Maximus Jonathan Onkeli, Minister of Energy, Green Technology and Water of Malaysia. And seated next to him on his right, from Brunei Darussalam, is His Excellency Pahin Datuk Dr. Muhammad Yasmin Umar, a Minister of Energy at Prime Minister's Office of Brunei Darussalam. Welcome, sir. And also joining us today is uh, uh, His Excellency Dr. Say Samal, a Minister of Energy, a Minister of Environment, yeah, from the Kingdom of Cambodia. Welcome, sir. And also with us today from Singapore, His Excellency Mr. Li Yi Xian, Senior Minister of State, Ministry of Industry and Trade, Singapore. Welcome. And today we have two industry speakers joining us. Uh, let me introduce on the very right is Yang Rabahagia Dato So Chubun. He's the president of the Federation of Malaysian Manufacturers. And sitting uh, right next to me, yeah, uh, we went to the same town, to this, uh, the school next to my school, is Yang Rabahagia Tan Sri Mustafa Mansour. He's the president of uh, Malaysian Green Business Association. Now, what we hope to achieve today is to understand a new challenge challenges in the global green movement landscape and seek new solutions to spur the green agenda. And we also like to hear and listen to stories in other ASEAN countries in how they're going green. And to start the session, ladies and gentlemen, we invite Malaysia's uh, Minister of Energy, Green Technology and Water, Yang Berhormat, Dato Sri Panglima, Dr. Maximus Jonathan Onkili, to share Malaysia's journey in generating green wealth. Over to you, sir. The Ministry uh, of Energy, uh, Green Tech and uh, uh, Water uh, is in the final stage of formulating the Green Technology Master Plan. Okay, um, Green Technology Master Plan. The Master Plan is uh, to promote green technology in four sectors that have been identified. Some of this I already mentioned, uh, especially in the areas of uh, carbon emission. Um, uh, and these are the energy, the transportation, uh, building and of course the west uh, the west sector among the anticipated outcome of, of uh, the green tech master plan is the emergence of a green market for goods and services uh, which would contribute towards the uh, sustainable uh, development agenda and we also acknowledge the need to support growth of the green technology industries in Malaysia as a crucial to establish a technological market and of course um, the, to lead to uh, to spur the, the 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 greening of the other the, of the other sectors, in terms of incentives, and this is where um, um, perhaps uh, uh, the industry side uh, uh, is watching. Uh, we have introduced incentives such as a pioneer status with the tax incentives for companies in areas such as energy efficiency and conservation, renewable energy, waste recycling. Uh, natural gas vehicles and uh, of course uh, hybrid uh, hybrid uh, cars on the energy uh, side um, um, as we have uh, away we we have uh, introduced the renewable uh, energy policy and uh, action plan and um, since two, 2010 and of course this led to the sustain enactment of the sustainable energy development authority SEDA uh, act and the Renewable Energy Act uh, in 2001. We managed the FIT. This is already uh, third year entering the, uh, the fourth year of the third year yeah, of the FIT uh, mechanism. And uh, we had set the target by 2020 of 5%, uh, um, uh, yeah, 5%. 
Um, and the latest figure shows that uh, if we are heading towards that, then if we were to adopt the classification that now the hydro sector is considered renewable, then uh, actually our energy mix, including that, is almost double digit in terms of renewable. Uh, debatable, but uh, 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 that is, uh, I think, the last ASEAN ministers meeting, they adopted uh, the definition that uh, um, renewable would include uh, the larger size of, uh, the, of um, uh, hydro. Okay. Previously, we were defining it anything less than 30 megawatt. But now, um, uh, um, even the Bakun now, we can include. Okay. Uh, you may want to raise those issues uh, if need be. Another one that we did uh, take part, of course, is um, in terms of financial support. The Green Technology Financing Scheme, uh, GTFS, uh, was established uh, to assist um, entrepreneurs and uh, um, both big and small, uh, but largely the smaller, smaller SMEs, SMIs that wanted to venture in the sector. This is where we allocated, the government allocated after uh, post Copenhagen uh, commitment, a 40% uh, reduction in per capita uh, intensity, capita, uh, carbon intensity. We set up the fund 3.5 billion, or oh, roughly about today's exchange rate of 1.1 uh, billion USD. Uh, out of that, almost 2 billion now has been consumed. Uh, 22 banks are participating. Uh, and in this, they need green certificate from the green tech. Um, uh, uh, of Malaysia, uh, and that with that they go to the banks and we subsidize the interest rate. Okay, uh, still available of about 1.6 billion uh, uh, for 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 the industry. Just now in the press conference, they did raise that. You know, um, yes, the money is there, but it's not as easy as uh, what minister is saying to assess the fund, uh, even though we give you the green certificate. Um, because it's managed by the banks, um, we subsidize the interest rate, as I have said. Uh, the banks, typically, they still go on the principle of uh, uh, profitability and bankability. Okay, and um, when new tech uh, comes in the market, uh, innovation comes to the market, among other problems, always been, of course, that many of these um, companies um, may not have the required long-term, uh, long-term track record and so uh, the, the thing that the banks are still very very strict with respect to the uh, managing of these uh, 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 loans eh? but now with 22 uh, banking institutions that are uh, offering it it has become very competitive compared to say when we started then there were only about four banks all right uh, just to move on a little bit there um, the rest of it I think um, as I said, looking forward, um, the green technology uh, uh, sector, uh, long term, we wanted, we expecting it to generate about uh, in terms of uh, investment value of Ringgit Malaysia, 6.34 billion um, uh, to create 2,149 green jobs and of course uh, to reduce carbon emission up to uh, 2.5 uh, uh, million tons of CO2. Uh, equivalent per year. It's good to see you again, uh, your, your, uh, His Excellency uh, Perhin Datuk Dr. Muhammad Yasmin Umar. Uh, the last time was last year, or the year before. Yeah, the year before. Yeah. Maybe you can update us uh, what's happening in Brunei when it comes to generating green wealth uh, at the moment. Yes. Thank you, so, <laughs> thank you, Swami. Yes. In our energy, our white paper, green growth is part and parcel of our strategic objective. I have uh, uh, another five points that we set a clear target. We set a clear target for green growth development, especially in terms of our energy intensity and renewable energy. At the, rest, the recent UN uh, Climate Summit, His Majesty the Sultan of Brunei, and his address at the summit has committed to reduce 63% of our primary energy consumption or better known as energy supply from business as usual with 2009 as a baseline. At the same time, we have aligned our national energy intensity targets with those of the APEC economy 
reduction of 45% by 2035 from 2005 level. On renewable energy, we aim to increase the share of renewable energy up to 10% of our overall energy mix by 2035. The benefit for us, in short, what it means is basically the reduction in carbon emission of 205,000 metric tons of CO2 per year. The amount of gas and oil saving amounting to US 1.1 billion for 20 years or United US dollars of 55 million a year. So if you look at, you know, for, for that period of 20 years, the amount become quite substantial. So we have identified our priority sectors and technology and construct pathway and action plan towards how to going to formulate this, these formulated targets. On EEC, we are focusing a lot on low-hanging fruits through the four major sectors, commercial, residential, transportation, and industrial sectors. We identified target technologies that could generate highest energy saving with lowest investment and intervention costs. These are an example of efficient air conditioning, lighting, building, transportation, and higher efficiency for a lot of our power station. In renewable energy, we look at especially in investment in renewable technologies. We are pursuing the development of solar PB technologies in the residential and commercial sector, micro hydro, large scale solar PB plant, and west to energy plant between 15 megawatt to 20 megawatts. On policy measure, our fifth, my fifth point is on policy measure. What kind of policy measure in terms of EEC and renewable energy uh, that we, we, we need to do? Uh, we in the introducing mandating policies such as standard and labeling and building energy efficiency code. With this policy in place, people have more option and, and guidance to make better energy efficient choices in appliances and buildings. And most interesting of all is our progressive electricity, electricity tariff, which we introduced uh, the year 2012. I will talk more about this uh, later. On renewable energy, to pursue policy that in, to, to give incentive to the private sector to invest in renewable energy technology. We look at what uh, the Malaysian doing, the fit-in tariff, but we also look at, I think, the Singaporean is on net metering, and also Philippines, also on more efficient energy technologies. And also, I think the most important is to ensure the economic feasibility of the renewable energy projects. One thing that's why me that I, I think that we can do a lot is to have this awareness, uh, to promote awareness among the public, among the what you call this, uh, am among the society itself. On top of the EEC, e EEC and renewable energy for policy measure, I would like to highlight the awareness rising as part and parcel of the policy. We establish energy club in school, energy exhibition and road shows in all district, and capacity building activities to educate public on EEC and to promote green growth development. Let me just share with you the success experience with our policy measures. Success experience with policy measures on revised electricity tariff. Uh, in January 2012, we revised the electric tariff towards a progressive structure. We give incentive to those people who want to save and penalize to those people uh, who uh, abuse uh, uh, the tariffs. So far, a saving of 12% in the residential sector has been achieved over the past two years. 
95% of household in Brunei has been replaced with the prepaid meters. People become more aware of their electricity spending, and again, we see this as educating the public and increase awareness. Better understanding has encouraged significant saving, and also it helped the government to address outstanding electricity bill issues. In summary, challenges will remain for us in implementing our effort toward green growth. We are not able to reflect the true cost of energy and for it to be market driven because of the heavy subsidies. And this is the real challenge for us. However, this should not stop us in our effort in green growth. It only means that we have to do it differently with more innovative solution to provide the sustainable and growth development will mean sustainable main source of revenue for the country. We are work in progress for another six to 12 months and we endeavor to follow best practices. Ladies and gentlemen, it's always a pleasure to be in IGEM and so I meet once again. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you very much. Let's listen to um, His Excellency, Dr. Se Samal. Uh, he is the Minister of Environment for Cambodia. Yes, on the journey uh, going green in Cambodia. So over to you. Uh, thank you. Uh, in the case of Cambodia, you probably aware that uh, we have a pretty unique uh, situation in our country. Uh, we didn't have uh, peace until '98. Uh, we did not have uh, stability until 2008. Uh, so for us, the opportunity for economic development was uh, quite relatively short. But having said that, the economic growth in the last uh, 10 years or so is quite uh, impressive. And it's helped to lift uh, the, the, standard, the living standard of our people. And, but at the same time, this also poses a challenge for us, a challenge for us in our obligation to the international uh, uh, treaties such as our Kyoto Protocol. Um, also also poses a challenge for us, how do we make our economy greener? Uh, of course, we want ec economic growth to provide jobs uh, for our people. Uh, to provide a better living standard for our people, but at, at the same time, we have to ask ourselves, how can we make our economy greener? And so one thing that uh, we, we do now is a, uh, we're looking at our energy. Um, most of our energy in supply now is uh, derived from uh, biofuel, mainly from biofuel. But uh, in the last uh, five years or so, uh, with the incentive we, the government provided and uh, with the encouragement uh, the government provided to uh, private sectors and also with the strong participation of provides, uh, from private sectors, we see the rise of uh, renewable investment in uh, renewable energies. Uh, this renewable energy in Cambodia can com come in a small form, in a very small form, in a uh, cooking appliance and uh, fuel for cooking in the rural area. As you probably aware that uh, we still have a large proportion of our people uh, living in a rural area and they still dependent on this uh, fuel uh, from wood uh, to cook their, cook their food. But uh, this renewable help, help to um, our people to shift away from dependent on wood products into a more renewable source uh, in, uh, in, in their living uh, practices. We also see a small to medium enterprise uh, uh, using rye hash to drive energy, to drive their own uh, small to medium enterprise in, in a sawmill. So this is another sign that uh, we also currently see. We see a uh, uh, biofuel derived from other sources as well. So this is also an achievement in, in, uh, in the last uh, f five to ten years or so. And um, we recently also put a tariff on a number of uh, uh, plants that are non, that are 
not are so environmental friendly. Uh, Second-hand uh, electrical appliances or appliance appliances that are not very friendly to uh, our environment, we put more tariff on, on that. Because uh, at the moment, the current situation in Cambodia, most people can afford a new uh, environmental friendly uh, electrical appliance to use in their household. So having seen that, and we exploit that opportunity by uh, reduce the tariff on this uh, new appliance, electrical appliance, but we increase the tariff on uh, old appliance. Uh, in this case, uh, let me allow, allow me to tell you that uh, in Cambodia previously, uh, to meet the demand of our, uh, our people, we allowed a lot of second-hand second -hand electrical appliance uh, to import uh, into Cambodia uh, to meet the demand. But at the moment, we can, uh, the, the trend, we can shift that trend. So this is also a good sign. And, um, and this starting this term, we also uh, uh, implementing uh, what we call a sustainable city concept. And this is sustainable city concept. We also looking at the way we design our city, uh, the way we design, design our building. And for us at the Ministry of the Environment, it's, all, it's also a proud moment for us. We got a grant from the government to build our own uh, new building. And this building is a green building. We follow a lot of uh, uh, environmental concept. In, uh, sorry, we incorporate a lot of uh, environmental concept into build this building because we want to show our people that the building of the Ministry of the Environment is also green. And uh, in addition to the uh, the practice, new practices, uh, my staff at the Ministry of the Environment, they turn, they tend to turn their aircon to about uh, 16 degrees. And uh, what we try to do in the Ministry of the Environment that uh, try not to wear soon and you know wear a short sleeve and then maybe turn the aircon to 21. It save a lot of energy as well. So, yeah. And uh, this is just a small practice, yeah, small practice that we can make uh, our life greener. And uh, the way we design our building, we work closely with the construction uh, ministry of construction to uh, uh, to to come up with a code of uh, designs that uh, people need to follow. This will help to reduce overall en energy consumption in our city. We also implement a number of uh, infrastructure development as well in Cambodia to help to ease the traffic jam uh, in the city. Uh, in the city at the moment, is the in Phnom Penh city alone, the traffic jam costs uh, it wastes a lot of energy, it wastes a lot of timing. So that's that is also a challenge for us. That uh, you know, a practical challenge for us that we need to build a better road to uh, to release this tra uh, traffic jam. And uh, we also create more uh, walking path. In Cambodia, we, the way we design our city is it makes people drive more. We don't plant enough tree. We don't have a path walk. So we, we use a lot of energy to move from one side to another side. So this is another thing that we push the, the governor, the mayor to, to create more path walk uh, on the street to make people walk more. Uh, so it's a lot healthier and uh, consume less energy as well, and uh, and uh, so we gr that's another thing that we uh, try try to push, and we also try to push for um, hybrid um, vehicle to uh, to for to to be used in in our city as well, and uh, I'm I'm seeing a project in uh, Siem Reap. They try to use a electric uh, motor to run a uh, tuk-tuk to transport uh, tourists around the Angkor city. So this is another thing that uh, we, we try to, to push as well. Uh, we, go, we work with uh, a Malaysian company and a Japanese uh, government as well in, in that project. Uh, hopefully it, it, uh, it take root and hopefully we, from there we can uh, develop into a, a different form of uh, transportation that can be used in, uh, in, uh, in Cambodia. Let's, let's listen to uh, His Excellency, Mr. Li Yixian, Senior Minister of State, Ministry of uh, Industry and Trade of Singapore. Well, as you may know, Singapore's uh, compactness really requires us to uh, plan our city very carefully 
uh, in a way that is clean, green and sustainable. So uh, for a long time, these kind of uh, uh, principal considerations have always been uh, our uh, driving force in terms of our uh, urban planning, industrialization, and also studying uh, the factors you know, interacting uh, with each other. So uh, under this context, perhaps for today's discussion, I would just share three points. Uh, first is Singapore's move towards cleaner energy. And second is about uh, how we are improving the uh, energy efficiency uh, of our building sector. And then three, uh, how we are creating the environment to uh, attract and encourage uh, clean uh, energy uh, industry development. First of all, on the uh, clean energy movement, well, uh, Singapore imports uh, all its uh, energy, so uh, it's important that we have energy sources that are uh, efficient and clean. And over time, uh, some of you may be aware that we have been switching to natural gas for power generation. So today, 90% uh, of our energy uh, is created through uh, natural gas. And uh, with the construction of um, our LNG, in fact, our first phase is operating uh, 3 million uh, cubic meter uh, you know, capacity of uh, uh, LNG terminal. Uh, we'll be able to import uh, more LNG from, from other sources. So that hopefully will help us uh, bring down the cost of uh, energy production. Uh, and also, uh, natural gas-fired uh, uh, power plant is, uh, by comparison, more efficient than fuel oil power plant. So in that sense, uh, we are also deriving greater efficiency uh, in terms of the uh, energy sector. Um, you, you heard of our, our uh, Dato's, uh, Yasmin's uh, comment on the Brunei's effort in terms of getting out from subsidy. Uh, in Singapore, of course, we, we don't subsidize uh, energy consumption. Uh, so right from the beginning, we, we uh, charge market rate. In fact, we have tiered tariff such that uh, big users uh, will be uh, you know, levied uh, more heavily uh, compared to uh, the initial uh, usage block. So uh, in that way, we uh, try to discourage uh, inefficient use of uh, energy. Uh, we also, uh, over time, introduce competition in the provision of uh, power plants. You know. So our power plants, over time, uh, have been privatized. So that is on the part of us converting to uh, natural gas, a cleaner form of uh, energy generation. Um, on the consumption side, uh, you know, in Singapore, 38% of our consumption uh, goes to buildings, buildings like this, convention center, shopping malls, residential, uh, commercial offices, uh, and some of the multi-tenanted kind of uh, uh, industrial buildings. So it's uh, very important for us to uh, ensure that building owners uh, take the right steps uh, in improving their energy efficiency of the building. And in fact, um, we have a national target to green 80% of our building stock by 2030. So in another 16 years' time, 80% uh, of our Singapore buildings, new and old, uh, should be green. And uh, by green, we mean that uh, they have to reach a certain green mark certification. Our green mark uh, scheme was introduced first in 2005, so that was an uh, initiative to encourage uh, building owners to uh, adopt environmentally friendly uh, uh, measures. Uh, but in 2008, three years later, we started to legislate. So whenever uh, new buildings uh, are to be constructed, they have to meet certain uh, green mark uh, certification. Then uh, when old buildings, when they are replacing, they are, uh, they, they are heating and not, not so much heating, but air conditioning system, chiller and so on, they also have to do an audit and uh, make sure uh, that uh, the new facilities will meet our Greenmark uh, certification. So I think for those of you who are in this business, 
uh, of uh, facilities management, of re retrofitting building with green technology, uh, I think this is a good news uh, you know, for, for those people in this business. Um, we also uh, incentivize the new developments uh, by giving uh, new gloss floor areas uh, to them. So in other words, uh, when they apply for, to build a new building, they may get certain gloss floor areas permission or plot ratio. Uh, but if their buildings are green, uh, or, and then we have a few categories, green, uh, green mark, green mark gold and green mark uh, platinum. So if they reach those levels, they will get the corresponding uh, incentives in terms of building more floor areas uh, for their own good. So I think this incentive uh, will help them, will help new building owners to, to adopt uh, new uh, uh, green uh, features for their building. Uh, we also have a 100 million uh, Singapore dollars green building incentive scheme for existing buildings. Right? This is uh, to help to subsidize the cost of retrofitting. And, uh, you know, so this scheme was uh, to provide credit facilities for commercial building owners to carry out energy efficiency retrofits uh, where our building construction authority will co-share the risk of loan default with financial institutions. Uh, so this is jointly run with financial institutions. So uh, on the back of all these efforts, we have achieved some good results. The number of green buildings went from 17 to about 2,100 now. And uh, you know, more than one quarter of Singapore's total uh, gloss floor area. So this is uh, our achievement now and we look forward to uh, more, as I say, 80% of all buildings by 2030. Uh, Singapore is also on the lookout for uh, best practices uh, around us and uh, in the world that we can adopt. And uh, through this interaction, I hope to also hear your views and suggestions on how else uh, we can improve ourselves. Thank you. Now, today we have two uh, industry speakers. Um, I would like to start with uh, Yang Bhagya, Dato So Chubun, President of the Federation of Malaysian Manufacturers. Uh, uh, he has lots to tell before the session. Uh, I've got a preview of uh, what he wanted to talk uh, about today. And I think he will share with us also his experience in the oil and gas industry and how uh, green technology applies in, in, in that industry. Uh, Dato? My background is in oil and gas. I grew up in it 44 years ago. I lived through it, and I'm still in oil and gas. Not literally, because that would be most uncomfortable. I remember about 10 to 15 years ago, the hot topic of the day was global warming. warming and ev everybody was concerned. Back then, the company I worked for, being an oil company, was always a target for environmentalists because all companies were all were blamed for all the pollution. But then the world needs energy, and until viable commercial alternatives are available, we have to depend on fossil fuels. So the company then recognized that the driving force going forward would be renewable energy, and invested quite heavily into man, looking at many different solutions, such as tin film, solar technology, wind, wind farms, conversion of cellulose waste into ethanol, conversion of wood waste into diesel, oil extraction from seaweed, biofuels, biomass energy, clean coal technology, carbon capture and sequestration. The reason why I'm giving you this long list is to point out to you that today, except for biofuels, conversion of sugar into ethanol, all the rest have not really taken off. On a, large, on a large commercial scale. While technology has been advancing, it has not been advancing fast enough, and they still remain expensive compared to conventional alternatives. And most people, given a choice, will not be willing to pay more. This is one of the dilemma we face. Most businesses, most of my members, do care for the people and the planet. 
as evidenced by their adoption of good corporate governance and adopting sustainable development as a guiding principle for conducting business. But they have to balance this between generating profit. Profit is essential, for without profit, businesses cannot exist. And when they cannot exist, they can do nothing for people and planet. So people, profit, people and planet must go hand in hand for businesses. I would believe that most people would agree that green technology is essential. And one day, it will become the norm, as the world cannot exist if you continue our current practices. We believe we need to transform, and transform quickly we must, or there might not be a world left for us to practice green technology. This transformation will not take place by itself. It cannot be left to the market. It cannot be left to the people. It has to be driven by the government. Bold leadership and new approaches to business investment and policies are required. Interventions are needed. I'm glad to see that Malaysia has made a very good start because in 2009, our Prime Minister announced the National Green Technology Policy. Many initiatives, many incentives and programs have been introduced and quite some success has been achieved. But more needs to be done and more needs to be achieved. It is against this background that I will give the manufacturers perspective on green technology on two aspects, in terms of adoption of green practices and in terms of manufacture of green products. Green practices have actually been fervently embraced by most manufacturers, especially as they help to eliminate waste, to reduce waste and costs, and improve productivity to sustain their competitiveness. There are many examples. I'll just pick one or two to, to give to you today. Uh, a ceramic uh, manufacturer uh, has adopted a zero water waste policy in which they implement rainwater harvesting and they recycle their wastewater. A new sprint manufacturing facility has invested 80 million ringgit in environmental protection and implemented some of the most stringent processes in the world. They have pioneered the application of the latest technology in recycled fiber pulping techniques to produce new sprint from 100% recycled fiber. The company is also using biomass to generate the energy they require. A rubber glove manufacturer has applied improved processes. Sometimes we think uh, you only need uh, equipment or technology. Sometimes it's, uh, it has to do with the processes that you adopt. So has applied improved processes and automation to reduce the number of workmen to produce one million pairs of gloves from 20 to 4. And that's quite an achievement. Energy efficiency is, most, is the practice that is most widely adopted and implemented. The uh, Malaysian government's move to rationalize or to remove subsidy on fuels is the right way to go because people must face the true cost of energy or they will never appreciate how valuable energy is. Smaller companies need help. Large companies can afford uh, change to more energy efficient equipment, but smaller companies, the SMEs, need help. Incentives are given by the government. But here is a small point to the government. Uh, you have to make the procedure simple. You have to remove the bureaucracy. You must make it transparent, and there must be fair access. Sometimes we are too enthusiastic and we put in procedures that make it almost impossible to, to get hold of the money. Uh, this is my plea to the government. So whatever incentive initiatives, please make it simple to apply for. The other, uh, the other factor is uh, you could use policy instruments because you, you to, to generate this market. But we have to do it very carefully. We have to do it gradually. We cannot impose uh, suddenly a big burden on the public or on businesses. So policy instruments such as banning the sale of inefficient uh, electrical appliances or, 
or specifying that all new buildings must be of a minimum green standard, I think would, should be the way to go to nudge uh, the people towards this green revolution. Uh, green technology encompasses many areas. Uh, and as a country, we cannot focus on all, especially in terms of manufacturing. We need to pick a few and focus on it. And we need to pick those that already we have a, some manufacturing base or areas where we have the resources. So in terms of manufacturing, Malaysia is quite strong in building materials, in electrical appliances, and uh, perhaps cars, green cars. And in terms of green energy, we do have a lot of biomass. And, but to make biomass commercially viable, a lot more R&D has been done. Because the process and the logistic in collection and the, the cost of palletization is still expensive. Uh, so we need to, to really do research to bring the cost down. And if we can bring the cost down, this will be a tremendous source of energy from green energy for Malaysia because we have so much biomass. So this is a very complicated subject and the short time available, I'm only able to give you a few points. I hope I've given you a flavor of the business perspective of green technology. In summary, many opportunities for generating wealth lie ahead for green technology. If we wait, when the time is right, I assure you, we will be too late. We must be bold and we need to start now. And it's up to the government to drive this revolution. Ladies and gentlemen, the Yang Berbahagia Tan Sri Mustafa Manso is the president of Malaysian Green Business Association. Over to you, Tan Sri. If we were to create uh, separate plans dealing with green growth, we would not have the desired end result as compared to the integrated overall development program. Because this is very important because the people, the, the riot, the, uh, the, uh, the private sector, will look at the Malaysia plan as a guide. And if it is, uh, if, if it is uh, stipulated in the, in the Malaysia plan, it will definitely uh, will benefit the private sector as well as the government. And uh, I'm looking at, the, looking at the way of life. Now, there are, we, if we look at uh, the environment, the, the landscape around us, we seem to be wasting a lot of energy. I do not know how, whether the government or any private sector has taken, have done a survey on the wastages of fossil oil, petroleum, diesel, petrol, diesel, gas, when there is a traffic jam in the city. The amount of energy being burned without the, the car moving forward. I sometimes wonder when I'm in the car and caught in the traffic jam, whether a, a study has been done. Perhaps I think this is the area that uh, we should look into. Now, looking at, uh, I know that uh, most of the um, members of the panel have indicated about the, the infrastructure, roads, buildings, and, uh, and if we see I would like to quote, for example, Kuala Lumpur, DBKL, for instance. Uh, we have seen that uh, the traffic jams, and we keep on widening the road. I know that certain areas need widening, especially the one, the, the, uh, the Trowong uh, near the uh, parliament there has got, there. I think uh, DBKL has started to work on it. But uh, most of the roads are wide enough to cater for five lanes each way, or four lanes. But that has been the hampered. People are not able to utilize all the four lanes. Why? Because park cars are parked along the roadside. 
Now, this is where the authority should come in and contribute to the, uh, to the prevention of wastages by implementing the laws. They're not supposed to be there, so we must make sure that uh, the rules are being followed and measures have got to be taken to ensure that uh, the roads that were built to have four lanes each way will not come down to reduce to two lanes. So that, that, that is the area that uh, we should, should be looking at. And uh, I know that I've, I was in Taiwan, in Taipei, uh, last month, uh, together with, uh, with a group of people, including the Deputy Minister of Keta. I told the, the Vice Minister of Trade then how Taipei has transformed over the last 20 years. Would you believe it? In Taipei, there, they don't have any areas for dustbins. No dustbins at all. That actually eradicate, in fact, prevent rats from yeah? uh, uh, multiplying, you know, multiplying. Why? They have changed the mindset of the people. Now, the same thing in Malaysia. We got to change the mindset of people. The attitude of the people has got to change. What they do in Taipei, this is something that uh, some of our local governments should look into. They have three collections a day. The waste, the waste, uh, the, the the waste collect, like the waste collection trucks, come round in the morning, again in the afternoon, and again at night. And it has become a practice that each house, a member of a household will stay back to ensure that he loads his, his uh, garbage onto the garbage truck. The other aspect that uh, we could see that uh, 20 years ago, Taipei was, a, was nothing except traffic jams, choker block. Now you see Taipei, the traffic flow is so good. Why? Because they have, uh, they have improved on the public transport, which we hope that Kuala Lumpur will be, able to, uh, will be able to have some improvement. But the other area that uh, they, they have gone into, this is uh, eco-friendly. They have started to cycle from their home to the station where they catch it, where they catch the train or public transport to go to their de destination or place of work. So those are the innovative uh, projects and strategies that we should be looking at. And uh, I like the, the way Singapore is doing, going to the children. Because uh, 10 years ago, I was in Singapore attending the Eco Product Exhibition and Conference. Singapore has started to educate the younger generation, even at the kindergarten stage. Now, gone are the days that we have actually have love for our environment. Gone are the days where you find in the kampong people using the sapulidi, eh, sweeping the, uh, the compound so much so that grass don't grow on the, on the ground in the kampong. So these are the, 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 uh, the, the, uh, the areas that we should be looking at. I'll have the last question. Coming from the media, I think, uh, well, last night, I didn't sleep last night. Well, I slept late because of this, so I did my research. There was a very interesting story about how a community in California Bay Area, uh, it's called the Urban Habitat. Basically, what happens over there is uh, um, the effort by the community, um, how they change low-income communities and, and communities of color by combining education 
advocacy, research and coalition building to advance economic, uh, environmental economic and social justice, where they don't just create jobs for big corporations, but improve the lives of the poor. I think, I think what's, uh, what we should what we want to hear more are success stories by the communities, and that will basically encourage other people to, um, I would say, support this. And there you are. There is the market that you really, really need, and that's the, uh, uh, I would say, the, the mass market, the huge market that you want. Uh, uh, Dr. Sri Panglima, if you want to comment on that. Um, uh, I think that's, uh, in the energy sector, that uh, concern has uh, also been also our 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 view and uh, and, and that's why um, with respect to the farming from uh, uh, power energy farming from uh, the perspective of um, uh, photovoltaic um, we continue to open the the the, uh, the quota for the individual household okay. Um, we close it a little while and then we reopen, but the uh, Economic Council has advised us that uh, um, um, uh, to, to make it really available to those who really want to participate. And for the first time, we are located for communities because even uh, uh, the mosque and uh, the, the temples want to farm, want to be involved in energy farming. And I think that's great because uh, Satu is income, two is uh, uh, participation. Uh, and I think uh, NGOs are, are speaking to us. So we're looking at that at this from the uh, energy sector side. I mean, technology should uh, uh, disseminate, should be disseminated to uh, be part of society. And uh, on the energy side, uh, you know, uh, as I said, uh, there should be no reason why the small man, small, man, the small woman, should not be allowed to, to participate. And, um, uh, improve their living from income that can be derived from the enterprise. Yes, and with that, thank you very much. I'm Gurhonma Datuk Sri Panglima, Dr. Maximus John Ongkili, Minister of Energy, Green Technology and Water of Malaysia. Thank you, His Excellency Pahin Datuk Dr. Muhammad Yasmin Umar, Minister of Energy at the Prime Minister's Office of Brunei, Darussalam. We say thank you to His Excellency Dr. Say Samal, uh, Minister of Environment of Cambodia, Thank you to His Excellency, Mr. Lee Yi Shan, Minister of State, uh, Ministry of Trade and Industry in Singapore. Thank you very much. And of course, to our two uh, industry speakers for today, Yang Bahagia Dato So Chu Boon, President of uh, the Federation of Malaysian Manufacturers, and also Yang Bahagia Tan Sri Mustafa Manso, President of the Malaysian Green Business Association.